Today's guest is Seamus Kearns. He's an inside account manager for Splunk. And although uh, I know him from that, we're gonna talk a bit about his you know, kind of side hustle or side job, which is farming. And I really can't wait to hear uh, and, let, and get you to hear about how that's uh, come upon uh, Seamus. And Seamus and I met as he's currently participating in the act I act Associates Leadership Development Program. And so thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Looking forward to talking about uh, some of the pretty wild things that happen uh, here on the farm. Yeah, so for those who haven't met you, had a chance to talk to you, um, share a bit about yourself, your background, where you're from, and what you do. Yeah, so uh, my background is I was originally born in Chicago, and then as a kid, I my parents moved out to Virginia, it's primarily where I grew up, and then from there, I moved back to Chicago for college, uh, DePaul University, and did about a year there where I fell in love with, at the time, hospitality. Moved out to Florida to finish another school down there. And then after I graduated, I ended up moving to Phoenix, Arizona as part of working for a hospitality company that I'd been internship or doing internships with during the summer. So they relocated me out to Phoenix and met my wife at college. She had, her family happened to live in Phoenix. So <laughs> moved out there, got married, bought a house, had kids. And then about six years later, Ended up uh, was the pandemic and was really looking to make a career change. Not that it was much of an option, but, but uh, I had time to look at other careers and a lot of friends had talked to me about getting into tech and I had the time. So really worked to find the right avenue and move out to uh, join a tech company, which is what I've done now. And that brought me back to Virginia, actually. So and in doing so, I ended up uh, out on a farm in uh, in Virginia. <laughs> so doing what I did not expect, but that's been the primary uh, primary shift of change that brought me back to Virginia. It seemed like I couldn't get away. So, and so yeah. So, we, so talk a bit about that. How did you, how did you end up on a farm, right? Cause you could move to Virginia. You could live in suburb or suburbia like I do, but you're on a farm. Yes. So we, well, um, put it this way. Well, there was we we used to live out in the country out here on the weekends there was a, a small place my parents had bought and it was a rinky dink shed that uh, really taught us the outside of tyson's life that, uh, that we were exposed to you know no dc that's for sure and from there we spent about 12 years on the weekends and summers coming down to this area just actually a couple of miles from where i am now and my parents would we would go around to different areas my parents would offer out our help like I got some fr young boys, free help, whatever you need done, <laughs> they're, they're there to do it. So that taught us a lot of, um, a lot of manual labor and a lot of the things that went behind what we saw on the shelves that you see in the store that comes so readily and what went behind it. So for us, it was really, it was a big learning experience and we, well, there are plenty of funny stories about that house, but I remember we had uh, the floors were so thin that you could, there was little cracks in between. It was just one piece of wood and we would be right over my mother's as uh, my brothers and I, and we would drop little spiders down on spring on strings over her while she was cooking. <laughs> didn't, uh, didn't end well, <laughs> it didn't end well for us, but that uh, they sold the place. And a couple of years later, they ended up buying another place out here as their final destination after they were, were looking to retire. And ended up being a little bit more than they could chew as far as property. And the previous guy had, uh, he had lost his wife and tried to keep the place for a couple of years, but you just kind of lose some motivation there. And the place kind of, uh, it, it felt its age to say for quite a while and passed over to them. But the way that I ended up here was when I found out I was moving back to Virginia, I had a year heads up, year notice. And they were looking to re either renovate the place or bring it back up to snuff. A lot of things were weren't falling apart and need to be brought back to code and et cetera, as far as uh, modernizing the place. But I had a heads up, told them, and they said, hey, this might be a win-win. If, if you're moving back and you only have to go in the office two days a week, market prices, great time to sell, terrible time to buy. <laughs> Why don't you maybe live in the old place and renovate it and take care of the farm and the property and then it'll actually be cheaper for us to to build our own little little space next door and it'll be a win-win for us we'll 
still be separate, but uh, together, <laughs> which uh, my wife's happy about. But that uh, that's how I came about being at the farm. And yeah, and know, that's not here. that's not uncommon, right? For farm farming families, right, to have multiple living spaces on a on a farm property. Yes, yeah. There's a surprisingly a lot of uh, almost valuing a lot of houses out here is how many outdoor buildings do you have? Seems to be a big focus when when people go around looking for property. But yeah, that's uh the more buildings the better, apparently. Right. So that obligates you to help with the farm, to do the farm, right? Uh what, what does <laughs> yeah. that mean? So for us, uh, or at least for myself, I should say, uh would be maintain uh bringing it bringing it back from anything that's that's fallen away to to regular maintenance. So repairing fences that have gone down to uh, relocating uh, fallen trees, anything that's that's taken out a fence or taken out trees or the rocks that are taken out or interrupting fields and cutting from anywhere from that to, I would say, replacing drive, you know, <laughs> you're having to cut up pieces of driveway and re-asphalt them or put, in, put down new tar and chip to pave roads back down through the woods, whatever you need to do to try to bring everything back that's kind of grown over is one portion, but then regular maintenance is having to get up and clear out whether it's been trees that are growing out through the fields or having to spray thistle and keep everything, the fields clear for cutting to cutting them themselves, which happens about twice, uh, twice a year, depending on how many cuts you're looking to do, if it's treated or not. And right now we don't treat the, the hay as it's the cost and demand for it's not that high. It's not worth it at that point. So just doing spot treatment of weeds and thistles, things that might make it on the lower end quality for a bale mm. is typically what we do, but not uh, not like nutrition uh, spraying or anything like that. It's going to be heavy for the growth. But from that, we typically do a couple times a year that gets cut and then baled. And then that's used to feed cattle at another farm. And so how many, how many acres uh, are you managing then? It's 75 acres for this side. Yeah. So what is, so what is 70? So, so for, for those people who don't have acreage, right? Uh, you know, backyards. <laughs> yeah. what, what, what does that mean in terms of like the time it takes to walk through it, to do the spraying you're talking about, watching for uh, trees or debris that you need to get out of the way so you can cut? What, what, what's that time commitment? So it, uh, it can be quite a bit of time. I'll say the, speed at which you drive a tractor is not very fast <laughs> so you're going about maybe a mile an hour or less when you're when you're cutting especially if you're trying to clear debris or you're or you're trying to be gentle in the fact that you don't want to rip up and start uh, causing damage within the field and you don't know what's happening in the field once it's starting to grow up i don't know how many boulders or rocks there are and it's easy to tip a tractor so you have to go slow and for cutting i'd say even a front field it could take couple of days wow. if you're spending eight hours you know you're doing eight hours you're getting out you're, you're clearing out the filters you're making sure things aren't over overheating the tractor nothing's blocked getting out and checking uh if anything's damaged or if you're i mean you're really just taking a break every so often and making sure that uh, nothing's clogging anything and you haven't run over something you don't have uh any issues going on or both blades are running on a bush hog just have yeah, just Honestly, the time it takes to check and recheck and make sure everything's going before you wasted five hours cutting and only one blade was working, you, it's uh, it's surprisingly time consuming for, uh, yeah. for what it is. Do you end up drafting your family to help with that kind of work? Uh, <laughs> I do try to get my brothers up here pretty often to to get their help. and uh, But one of them, he's big into hunting, so... He's usually out there trying to trying to hit something or land something. But from uh, my other brother, he's got plenty of kids. He's pretty busy. And but when he comes out here, he's always eager to take a break from them, too, and get out there and, and help. So which is great. But the yeah, that's just, so I say it's total family business, but uh, on the weekend, sometimes it is. Sure. So is that is that something you have to deal with on a daily basis? Are you are you going out in the fields or walking around the property before you head off to Splunk, or <laughs> yeah. is it something you can manage kind of on a weekend basis? Um, I would say it's I could probably do it twenty four seven for a year and 
not uh not fulfill everything that needs to be done <laughs> it needs wow. to be done so it's uh i think as you go along and i when i got here the more you do the more things you find hmm. and that's the list just gets longer as you feel like you're checking it off you got two or three things to add to it um typically not every morning but a couple mornings a week i do i'll get up early and and check around whether let's say has there been damage or a fence fallen or something that may have come or trespassers you run into that sometimes too surprisingly but the afternoons is usually when i try to get something done and whether it's during lunch breaks i'll go out and start pushing out trees or things that are growing in the field spraying getting rid of uh anything that's being uh i would say kind of an infiltration of the of the fields but uh, usually on the nights after the kids go to bed is sometimes when I'll go out and, and do a lot of stuff. It's a little easier for me to, I'm more of a night owl. So if I can go out there, there's enough lights on the tractors to see, and you can get, get plenty of work done there as well at night, but just depends on what I'm doing. Some stuff you got to do while it's daylight. Don't want to run over something and cause quite a bit of damage or find myself stranded mm -hmm. pretty far from the barn. Wow. So coming back to Virginia, are you a natural farmer? Or is this something you had to rely on others to help educate you? Uh, not a natural farmer at all. <laughs> I'm uh, still learning. I'm still learning. The, mostly the hard way. But uh, there is a, there's a gentleman that we met. Actually, when I was kids, I knew him. He sold us my our first little farmhouse out here that my parents had. And then he gave us you know, my first pocket knife first bb gun this guy's been teaching us the ropes as far as being out here and he himself is a he's actually a full-time realtor full-time farmer he's got hundreds of acres and 100 cattle he's he does it all so that's everything i've learned from is from him it's a guy steve sager that knows everybody in the town he's just that guy that you learn from nice that's always good to have a community like that right um you hear that a lot in, in agriculture communities where people help each other. And you don't hear that so much in the suburbs or in Tyson's or DC. <laughs> That's true. This is definitely an area where everyone waves, put it that way when you're, when you're driving. So as you've been doing this, uh, what's, uh, you know, and you're, and you continue to manage this farm and you're figuring out things as you go. What about this experience you think is making you a better person when it comes to your, your full-time job here, you know, at Splunk? I would say for me, it would be, just really learning the harder side of things. It could be when you when you're really down and out in the middle of, of nowhere and you don't have much to you don't have much to work with and something goes wrong, it's a lot. It's you're you're really gotta be in real survival mode. And so when something at work happens, it's almost like I could fix this isn't the end of the this isn't the end of the world. I, this isn't gonna I'm not stranded out somewhere and having to move some heavy machinery up a hill or this can be overcome. It's no small, uh, it's not the end of the world compared to what I could run into outside of work. So it, I think it's helped give a little bit of a better perspective into issues and challenges that I run to at work. Oh, I think we could all use that. Sometimes when we have an IT issue, we think it's the end of the world, right? <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> So, so what's next for you? I mean, in, in terms of this farming thing, is this a, is this a new lifestyle for, from here on in? Is this a, a temporary journey or how do you picture it for yourself? So uh, definitely something I want to continue. I'd say it's, it's been tough, but, and it's been a learning experience to say the least, but it's also heavily rewarding at the same time. There's nothing about doing something yourself or, manual labor that really gives some strong fulfillment. And when you've done something, you actually see it, it, it really gives you, a, I would say, a purpose and almost in a sense too, where you've you've done some work, you can see the, the fruit of, of your labor. And for me, it's something I want to continue. So looking at the next place we'd like to move to, once kind of get everything back up here, and if we can end up leaving, <laughs> depending on what they need will be continuing the farm life. That's mm -hmm. always been a portion of me that I believe is locked in now. And I've already, we're already looking at places where we're looking to get a little bit more land and 
try to find some places out in the country, even if it's not Virginia, that will be kind of continuing that same life and an opportunity. Nice. And you're growing your own workforce. Eventually they'll be there. <laughs> I am. Yes. Uh, train these kids as much as I can, but uh, yeah, that'll be, that, that's pretty much our vision and the way life and I want to do. There's wow. tough part of socializing though, when you're out in the country, <laughs> it's a uh, right. so many neighbors, but yeah, we have Zoom. We have Zoom nowadays, at least a little bit. Right, exactly. So, not too hard anymore. Well, Seamus, I, I really appreciate you sharing a bit about uh, this lifestyle you've taken on and and how you fell into it and the impact it's had. So, uh, just thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate having me, Jeremy. Thank you so much.